this time on the Highland Woodworker. I do a lot of traditional furniture. Um, I'll work in different styles, but I lean a lot toward, uh, you know, the traditional lines and craftsmanship. And uh, I make a lot of things that I like, honestly. Master furniture maker Daniel Corbin gives us a tour of his exceptional handcrafted pieces, then demonstrates how he gets tiger maple to come alive. Many times you'll need a bar clamp to assist with your project, but what if you still need more reach? Popular Woodworking Magazine extends a helpful tip. All of this and more, this time on the Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I'm here once again in the Highland Woodworker online classroom. This is where we produce dozens of online classes with world-renowned woodworkers and teachers for you to stream on your schedule. For more information about becoming a member, go to highlandwoodworking.com. And while you're there, check out Highland Woodworking's wide selection of the finest woodworking tools available and experience their great customer service since 1978 from their store to your door. Daniel Corbin grew up in an artistic household. It was that influence along with his history major in college that would come together and lead to a successful career as a self-taught period, and traditional furniture maker. Let's meet Daniel Corbin now in our moment with a master. Daniel Corbin, I remember the day that I met you. And it's been, what, at least five or six years. That is. I, I was at a festival uh, where they had just a, a lot of very artsy uh, crafts everywhere. And I was walking along, and all of a sudden something struck me, and I told my wife, I said, I gotta go back and look at this. I said, I saw some beautiful furniture that just really surprised me. So I went back, and I met you. And I tell you what, I, it just gets better and better. Looks like you do traditional furniture. I do a lot of traditional furniture. Um, I'll work in different styles, but I lean a lot toward, uh, you know, the traditional lines and craftsmanship. And uh, I make a lot of things that I like, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I understand. And uh, I think both of us, from our conversations, we found out that uh, we like to go to Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a, a museum there that influenced you as well as me. Uh, tell everybody about it. Yes, um, I, my mother's side of the family had uh, lived in Williamsburg area, and so we made a lot of trips there when I was a child. Um, we'd go in the summers, and uh, I would be bored with it at the time, but somewhere I think it sunk in, you know, this, there was really good work there. It was all around in the colonial area and the museum that you spoke of, and the wood shop there is phenomenal. Um, and I think uh, without knowing it, probably gained an appreciation for traditional furniture. And uh, you know, that came back to be, I think, pretty beneficial later on. So. Sure, yeah. Um, but you're also influenced by, I think your dad, is that correct? Yes, uh, my father uh, is an artist. He paints, uh, does oil paintings, watercolors, that sort of thing. Um, and so I grew up with an appreciation for handwork and, uh, you know, the time that it takes uh, and uh, just a real appreciation for art in general. We would make it to different museums, probably just a little more than average. And uh, so I think that uh, influence did come through. What was the first thing that you built that you went out and showed everybody and said, hey, look, I did this? Um, probably it would be a... Uh, shaker end table. It's just a little square end table with uh, tapered legs. Um, I remember that. I saw an article in a magazine and I thought, that's pretty. I could use that. That doesn't look too intimidating. Mm -hmm. So I studied up and um, 
I tapered the legs with a jigsaw, which I wouldn't recommend to anybody, but <laughs> I kind of had the bug. I wanted to build things. Yeah. And uh, so I got them smoothed down to where they were manageable and, um, you know, made it out of cherry. And I've still got it. It's in my house. It's a little worse for the wear, but. <laughs> uh, this is just some phenomenal work. Um, now, this piece is not for everybody. No, no, I would think not. Um, <laughs> uh, the first one of these I made was a custom order. Um, mm -hmm. I had done a show similar to the one uh, where we met mm -hmm. and uh, had a customer that wanted uh, a chair like this to give to her husband as a gift. And I thought, well, they'll want mahogany, you know, uh, would be a traditional choice. And she said, first thing she said, I don't want mahogany. And I said, what do you want? And she yeah. said, I like the tiger maple stuff you have. And yeah, that piece got a lot of attention, honestly, in the photos and that sort of thing. So right. I've continued on with those. Tell us about how it's made. It's, uh, yeah, it's really traditional um, in most aspects. The uh, It's all mortise and tenon uh, joinery. Um, and uh, the, the seat is a woven rush seat. Uh, that was a choice of the client as well. Um, at the time, I didn't like that, and I've really grown to be pretty fond of it, honestly. Mm -hmm. Well, Daniel, uh, being a, a woodworker or a furniture maker, I'd like to see how you built it underneath. Sure. Let's kind of look at the guts. Absolutely. Um, here the... The legs are all attached with mortise and tenon joints, mm -hmm. um, very traditional. Underneath, well, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, the seat frame is mortise and tenon as well, uh, and that provides the frame for the rush weaving. Does this all sit in there? It like does, yes. It just... This is uh, attached uh, uh, with screws there on uh, some corner blocks that I can show you here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And... If we go up here, used uh, some pretty substantial corner blocks. Now this would hold together on its own fine with the mortise and tenon joints. Sure. They're you know, quite substantial, but uh, mm -hmm. these corner blocks are measured to the correct depth for the seat. Mm -hmm. And then that allows me to just drive a screw in to keep the seat in there. These seats don't last forever, so this is easily removed if need be to do any repairs on the rush seat or if somebody preferred a upholstery or something like that, that can be done as well. Right. Uh, well, just beautiful. Yes. And so uh, this gives you a little bit of give in the middle too since your corner blocks are over there. It does, yes. And I've, I've had this uh, chair at some different shows and people ask to sit in it and they're, they are surprised at the comfort of that, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I bet. Uh, well, just beautiful work. Daniel, this really shows uh, the beauty of the wood and your artistry. I mean, Thank you. I think this is one of the things that just absolutely caught my eye is you're able to get it to pop. And just a little later, I think we're gonna show how you do that. Yes. But I tell you what, this table, there is, it looks simple in some ways, but it's very complex. So what do you call this table? Uh, this is a Porringer table, um, really traditional design. Uh, it's not one you see as often anymore. Comes from this corner here, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, just a, a beautiful set of lines there to complement the, the, uh, the wood and the finish. Uh, tell me about these legs. Yes, the legs are done on a lathe. Uh, of course, they're turned. There is a process that's a little different to doing those. Uh, the, the leg is actually turned offset axis. Uh, so it tapers inwards just a little bit. Instead of turning off of true centers, mm -hmm. one side is offset from that center, leaving it to go kind of chick, 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 chick as it turns. Is that, is that the idea? Not exactly. It is offset, but you're, when it's offset on the lathe, um, you still have a straight axis uh, relative to the centers. Uh -huh. And so that uh, gives you this pattern and then your feet are turned on a different axis. I see. Well, this looks like it's kind of tapered away from the corner. Is that right? Yes, it is. Yeah. It's not 
a straight line on the legs. They are tapered inward a bit. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the legs themselves taper. This diameter is smaller than this one, obviously. And this is what gives you your pad foot by having that off axis. Well, that's really beautiful. And it sets off the curly maple just beautifully as it wraps around. Uh, yeah, it makes a really appealing pattern, in my opinion, if you can get that green to show up correctly. Yeah. Now, uh, you do work in other woods, too. I know this has always yes. caught my eye, but uh, tell us about some of the other woods that you use. I use um, a lot of domestic hardwoods, even some exotics, that sort of thing. i um, done a lot in uh, natural cherry, dark cherry finishes then as well. Um, a lot of what I made initially was black walnut. Um, mm -hmm. I made some pencil post beds um, that I was really pleased with. Your pencil post beds are beautiful. That was one of the items that caught my eye at that uh, art show. Yes, yes. Um, I'm glad it did because those are a headache to carry out to an art show. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, yeah, the pencil post beds are a lot of fun to do. Um, it's uh, get a lot of satisfaction out of that. Uh, now, to turn a pencil post bed post, have you got a long lathe or you do it in sections or what do you do? No, um, the, my pencil posts are actually octagonal and so there's no turning on my pencil posts. They have a square yeah. base and then they taper up octagonally uh -huh. and uh, that's done. So with, you've got uh, a big taper jig. Um, yes, taper four sides and then do the other four sides on the router table and it takes a sled that gets the right angle and uh -huh. that gives you the octagonal pattern. Let's talk about your uh, ability to get this, uh, this beautiful wood to pop. Sure, um, it's not a really complicated process. There are some steps that are uh, take a good amount of care that I use, but I've done a lot of test finishes, a lot of things like that, and this is what I've been happiest with. Mm -hmm. um, a big part of it is in the surface prep to me. I found when if I tried to cut any corners with the surface prep, that was a really poor decision. Yeah. Um, on a top like this, this is a three-piece top. I would always make that out of the same board. So this was all one long plank and right. that gives me the good grain pattern uh, where it's consistent. Mm -hmm. um, quite often I'll use a skip grit technique. I don't, um, I'll just use random orbit sander. I'll go up to 220. But I found that the sanders are good enough quality now. I can go 100, 150, 220 without any mm -hmm. uh, ill effects. So at you're all. skipping a grid in between, like exactly. between 150 and 220, you skip the 180. Yes. Yeah. I do. Um, and that can be adjusted as well. It's the color uh, process to this is influenced by how high a grit you go to. And absorption rate for precisely the, for the color. Yeah, yeah so the higher grit you go the less absorption you get and you mm -hmm. can adjust your color tone that way uh, what causes this tiger maple effect here or um, flame effect sure it's kind of an irregularity in some of the maple logs um, you get the grain that'll grow in a circular pattern and you get soft grain next to hard grain and so that's the difference here is you got soft and hard, soft and hard, and, uh, and it's going uh, horizontally uh, or a 90 degree angle to the long grain. Correct. Well, Daniel, uh, you've got quite a career ahead of you as a furniture maker. Uh, what would you like for people to remember or think about Daniel Corbin Furniture? Well, I hope people enjoy my work, you know, if it's something that brightens their day to see something uh, that's well-crafted, you know, and just to have something to admire in their homes. Um, another part of that would be, I would hope that, uh, you know, my family would enjoy some pieces when I'm gone, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. I'm a history major, I enjoy the history of things, and so that sort of thing appeals to me, and uh, I would hope it would to, you know, somebody in my family at some point down the road. Later in the show, Daniel Corbin shares his secret to a fine finish. Plus, 
The Big Squeeze. Popular woodworking magazine broadens our knowledge about bar clamp extensions in their tips, tricks, and techniques segment. Stay with us. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. I'm just an average down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably about a 5. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here, and I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw, and there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop. Whiteside Machine Company has been in business for over 30 years providing customers with quality router bits. Fine Woodworking Magazine has declared Whiteside Router Bits best overall and best value when compared against 17 other brands. No matter the router application, they have the type and profile of carbide router bit you need. When you put a Whiteside Router Bit to work in your shop, it is guaranteed to make you smile. Highland Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading bandsaws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon. Power tools. I've been using Forest products for years. You know, they're the maker of the Woodworker 2 saw blade. Gives great cuts on your table saw every time. Now, I have a chop master for my miter saw. I have a dense piece of two by two walnut, and as you see, it cuts like butter, leaving clean cuts at 90 degrees. Forest, the cuts will make you smile every time. We all know that woodworkers old adage that you can never have too many clamps. But what happens when you need clamps that are bigger than what you have? Well, we have a great reader's tip here that we actually use in our shop here at the magazine quite often. Let me show them to you. So this is a standard size bar clamp. Uh, it's about 36 inches long, but when you need to reach a little bit, that's when we have the extendo clamp. This is an add-on to most any bar clamps. What it is, is a piece of wood, in this case it's hard maple, uh, that is cut to accept an aluminum extension that allows you to make these clamps really whatever size you'd like. The wooden bar is simply notched on the end uh, to create this tenon that fits inside of the clamp. Then on the top side, we have a groove that's cut along the entire length of it. And inside that groove, we have a piece of a quarter inch thick aluminum. And that aluminum has, uh, for lack of a better term, dados in it every inch that allow you to slide the movable head and lock in place. Now the aluminum is attached to the wooden bar with a couple of countersunk screws about every foot. And then the entire thing is held into the bar clamp with a pair of bolts and nylon lock nuts. And one of the things I really like about this 
is you can quickly remove it. So if you don't want to store a 7, 8, 10, 12 foot clamp in your shop, you can simply break it apart and store the two halves separately. But when you do need a long clamp, you'll be thankful for this tip to get that extra reach that you need. The problem is many times I need to cut a small uh, strip of wood off of a block of material like this. Well, when I get ready to cut it, I need to be able to push it through there and have control and, uh, and be safe. Those are always important. Well, with this push stick, it's configured wrong. This one, well, this is kind of a manufactured push stick. It's not right for that situation at all. And this one's still too big too. What do I need? Well, what I need is the gripper. Uh, the gripper complete system. Uh, it will provide control of the stock and it will provide safety. You need confidence that you have control over the cut, over the wood being fed into the blade and what is coming out on the outfeed side. You want to do it all without worrying about getting your fingers in the table saw blade and without having to reach around the blade finally at the end of the cut. The gripper will get you a grip on safety and control at the table saw by keeping pressure on the workpiece, keeping the pressure down and against the fence. It adapts easily uh, from cutting thin stock at an eighth of an inch to wide panels if you're using double grippers. I think it's best to start with the complete gripper system that I'm showing here and consider the gripper accessories to suit the projects that you do. And it makes a great gift for any woodworker, one that will keep woodworking safe and make everyone smile. Coming up, Daniel Corbin's finish to remember. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. Meet the Bora Centipede, the lightweight and portable workshop table that supports up to 3,000 pounds, stores in a small space for tight shops, and opens into a work table to bring your work to a comfortable height. This makes the perfect companion for your track saw. Comes with X cups and hold downs to secure your work. Just add the Boro workbench top and you've got a great auxiliary table anywhere in your shop. Upgrade your shop today. There's four words that Lee Tools lives by. Four words that mean quality joinery to take your projects to the next level. Whether it's dovetails, box joints, or mortise and tenon. And we'll even help you clean up. Those four words, better tools, better results.
didn't make it to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia, you can shop online at highlandwoodworking.com. They're great at getting what you want to your shop quick. Let Highland's legendary wood slicer resaw blade help make it easy for you to get great results sawing thick lumber into thinner boards. The wood slicer is designed to cut much faster, smoother, and quieter than ordinary bandsaw blades. You'll be amazed at how smooth a surface you'll get with a wood slicer. Its variable tooth pattern greatly reduces noise and vibration. Order a wood slicer from Highland Woodworking for your bandsaw today. Daniel, you're going to show us how to get this tiger maple or flame effect just to pop. Yes, sir. It's the same finish that I use on the pieces that we've looked at. Um, I use an aniline dye. Uh, I use a water-based, uh, which a lot of people don't like. There are some ups and downs with that, but uh, it can be used very effectively, I think. Um, the problems can be solved with well, that. When I've tried uh, water dyes before, I get this real flat look. Yes, definitely. And I brought a couple pieces that yeah. kind of illustrate that. Um, one of the main problems with a water-based stain is going to be it raises the grain. Um, and there's a few steps you're going to take to offset that effect. Yeah, that's the flat look. Yes, that is a piece that's been prepped and it's got an aniline dye on it with no top coat. Okay, and this has a... Um, that has a lacquer top coat on that. Same mm -hmm. color treatment, but it, you can see how much that really changes once you put a top coat on. It's uh, Yeah, it really brings it out. It's got depth all of a sudden, but it doesn't have depth when you just use the, the water-based stain. Yes, and a lot of people panic the first time they use water-based dye. They'll come in and see the piece when it dries and they think it's ruined. Don't panic, it will come out with the top coat. All right, well, show us your steps here. Sure, um, I start with surface prep. Um, you know, sand up to a 220. Uh, that gives me the surface I want and it also gives me the absorption rate that I'm looking for. That can be adjusted to your taste. Uh, the aniline dyes are very flexible to use, and part of that is what grit you sand to. You can sand to 150, 180, 220, and it's gonna get a little bit lighter as you go. And just the same as you can adjust your color with the aniline dye as you mix it. I see. So start. I start with a 220 grit um, mm -hmm. surface, and uh, this is really important. It's a very inexpensive step, but it'll save you a lot of headache potentially. Mm -hmm. Um, I raise the grain on these pieces, um, and I do that with distilled water. Uh, okay. Distilled water has no minerals in it. Mm -hmm. If you use water out of the tap, you may have minerals. They may react with your wood, and you get black spots. Um, ah, all right. Distilled water is a dollar a gallon, well worth the trouble. Uh, <laughs> all right, sounds like it. Yes, and typically I'll uh, wet the piece. You're going to feel that, uh, get kind of a fuzzy, rough feel to that mm -hmm. after you've raised the grain. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of things you can do after that. Usually I just use a sanding block like this, and I use a worn piece of 220. If you don't have that, you can go up to a higher grit. Mm -hmm. it, you don't want to be very aggressive with that, and you're just going to go with the grain mm -hmm. until you get back to that smooth feel. I see. And uh -huh. you'll be able to feel that. It's not a sight thing. You don't want to overdo that because you can cut down to new grain and you're going to re-raise the grain when you apply the dye. So you can go too far. I think that's a problem I've had with it. Yes, it is. It does take a little getting used to. Once mm -hmm. you get down to a good, uh, really smooth feel, it mm -hmm. takes a very light touch is all that's necessary. All right. Um, I use an aniline dye. Uh, it's just a powdered form. Um, they can, a lot of them can be used with alcohol or water. In my mm -hmm. experience, I've had better luck with water getting the color that I want. The mm -hmm. alcohol might not raise the grain as badly, but I have not been able to achieve the color that I want with the alcohol-based dyes. Okay. Um, that's a matter of personal preference. If you can get one that works with alcohol mm -hmm. dye, I would encourage you to do so. And you can also use a, a liquid, and I think today you had a little bit of a liquid dye that we use. Yes, uh, there are liquid options that dissolve in water or alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the time I use the powdered dyes, and you can mm -hmm. mix colors very effectively. Sure. This is a mix. Um, use different ratios and strengths. Um, mm -hmm. 
I'd highly encourage people to do test pieces. It will save you a ton of headache later. Um, yeah, especially for a customer. Certainly, yes. certainly. Uh -huh. um, one last point also, the aniline dyes are not quite as light fast as some stains. I generally use a lacquer that has a UV protectant in that. So and that's where you get your protection. Yes. Uh, yeah, all right. That's the dye smart. provides absolutely no sealing properties or protection at all. Uh -huh. um, and I generally use a solvent-based product. Uh, if you use a water-based top coat, you can uh, reactivate the dye and get uh, runs and sags and that sort of thing. I've been trying to keep out of sags for years. So, <laughs> all right, so uh, you're going to apply some, some dye? Yes, I uh, always wear gloves. This stuff will stain your hands extremely and uh, always use a good set of gloves. And these are nothing fancy. I just get the nylon gloves from the big box store. There you go. And there are several ways you can do this. Some people prefer to flood the surface with a spray bottle or a sprayer mm -hmm. and wipe the excess off. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good method. I actually prefer to get a damp uh, cloth that's just dry, old t-shirt material. Works great. Right. And get that in your dye. It's very concentrated. And... You want to keep a wet edge with this. And you don't want to over wipe on this. This will get lap marks um, mm -hmm. easily. And so something in that neighborhood is really all you need to do. I see. You can let that sit um, for several minutes, four or five minutes. If there's any excess, just wipe that clean and you're mm -hmm. set. Yeah. Uh, that needs to dry for 24 hours minimum before you get a top coat on there. Uh, you don't want it to dry and have the water um, form condensation under your film finish. I that see. can ruin a finish. Yeah. Um, fast forward to tomorrow. <laughs> All right, here we are. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I saw the, the sun go down and <laughs> came back up. And so now... This is gonna to dry to be similar to this. Okay. Now we did raise our grain previously. It's gonna raise it a bit again, mm -hmm. no matter how good you are. I use the same Warren 220 block. Warren 220, Warren, yes. yes. Okay. I've found even using a really high grit that's a fresh mm -hmm. piece, it cuts through to your wood and it's, that's really hard to repair with dye. It's I not see. too forgiving. Yeah. And so you can go over that just very gently and just the weight of the block is almost enough to take the fuzz off. And again, you'll be able to feel that difference when you get to the point. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be fairly obvious. Wow, all right. And uh, also illustrated on this piece, um, the nature of the wood matters a lot, how absorbent it is. When you're doing a table edge that has your exposed end grain, mm -hmm. you want to sand that to one grit higher than you did your surface. I see, because of the absorption rate is yes. different on end grain than, yes. And I prepared this piece to intentionally try to show how much darker that is. These are sanded to the same uh, grit, but mm -hmm. you have a pretty noticeable contrast between the top and the side. So if you go up one more grit, you're going to blend in much better with an aniline dye. All right, wonderful. Wonderful information. And then from there in your process, after yes. sanding to, to gently with 220, yes. then you, per, you use a lacquer finish. Yes, I've uh, used lacquer for several reasons. Um, I like the, I use a pre-catalyzed lacquer, which is a little tougher than some of the old school lacquers. It has an acid catalyst. It bonds uh, really hard. I've found there's less trouble with uh, putting a drink on that accidentally overnight. Um, uh, typically that doesn't leave a ring. Mm -hmm. um, it's resistant to chemicals, that sort of thing, to a pretty good level. Um, and one thing I really like about that, I can finish a project in one day. Those coats dry within about a half an hour, so I can spray six coats in one day um, pretty easily. Uh, so that allows me to do both sides of a tabletop. I'll do mm -hmm. three and three. Right. It's about all that takes. Um, and then let that cure out and it's ready to go. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm excited to know about this and I can't wait to put this to use. Fantastic. Man, I'll be playing a beautiful mandolin with that look. Thank you so much, Daniel Thank Corbin. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, yeah.
improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode of The Highland Woodworker. Be sure to check us out on social media. And until next time, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker.